and once again I'm going to read uh, verses 7 to 14. Hebrews 13, 7, we read this. Remember those who have spoken the word of God to you whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar for, from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise. Father, once again, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you that you have taught us at the end of Peter's second epistle that we need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Father, I would pray today that as we consider Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And today as we consider the need to not be moved away from that truth and that faith by various and strange doctrines. But Lord, that our hearts would be established by grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would accomplish that work in our hearts. Uh, and Lord, you know our need for that to happen. And I would just pray and ask that your spirit would guide us into your truth and, and do that work in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I would just remind us quickly that the message of Hebrews is a call to genuine believers to a confident, assured perseverance of faith, um, to a hope that enters the very presence of God. A hope that we as believers recognize and understand that we can confidently enter the very holy of holies. But not because of anything you've done. Or I've done. But because of what Christ has done. And our hope is in the Lord. And, and such faith, again, the purpose of Hebrews is that by such faith we would overcome great trials of suffering and faith in this fallen world. And, and folks, I, I, I focus on that. I emphasize that because I see too many of us dropping like flies at trials of suffering and difficulty and discouragement. And we can all face it. And we can all stumble and we can all have those times of doubt but that's why we need the body to pick us up to lift us up that's why we need to consider each other to stir up to love and good works that's why we need as we saw last week to recognize and understand the need for the ministry of faithful spiritual leaders in our lives but today we want to look at, at two more because as we're studying in Hebrews, we, we've come to chapter 13 where I think we see some expectations of, of faith in the lives of genuine believers. And, and uh, that is the, the spiritual transformation that takes place. We looked at that in the first six verses of chapter 13. Last week we started to look in chapter 13, verse 7, 
at spiritual stability. Where does that come from? How does that happen? What, what does the writer of Hebrews, again, the writer of Hebrews has, what is it, 24 verses left, or 19 verses left. What, what did the Holy Spirit move him to write to you and I, to the believers, the, the Jews in the first century, and to you and I, that would help us to, to persevere in that faith. Last time we saw in verse 7 this idea of, of the need to recognize and understand uh, the ministry of faithful leaders. Today we want to move on to the next one. And that's this. Another building block, if you will, of spiritual stability is faith that is resting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I, I would hope and I would expect that many of us at church people, church people say, yeah, okay, let's move on. I got that one. Let's look at it. Let's look at it. Because I think there's a message here in, in verse 8 that should thrill our hearts um, and, and equip our hearts. Uh, if we have time, we're, we're going to look at a third one, and that is this, faith that rests in in and true doctrine. Uh, I will tell you, I don't know if we're going to get to that one. But let's look at least at this, this second building block of, of spiritual stability or perseverance. Faith that rests in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8 says this. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, today, and forever. You'll notice I left the word is out because it's not in the text. It's implied for translation purposes. Literally the verse says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Folks, again it may sound initially like you know, that's, that's a truth we already got. It, it might even sound like, well, how, how or why did he stick this in here? Any of you think that? Okay, nobody but me. You know, here he is talking about spiritual leaders. And all of a sudden he says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and then he's going to talk to us about not being moved away. And, and as we study this, and, and folks, I want you to understand that that's... That's what I believe my, my job is to do, is to study and pour over this till I, I believe I understand why the Spirit put that there for you. And when you start to see that truth, there, there's nothing like it. Um, and then to proclaim it. But, but why? why? Why does he say that here? Well, because Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. He's eternal. He's the unchanging Savior. He was the unchanging Savior in eternity past. He is the unchanging Savior today. And He will be the unchanging Savior for all eternity. What are the implications of that? Again, looking at the text, it says... Jesus Christ, the same. The one. The same one. Literally, Jesus Christ, the same one. That he was yesterday. That he is today. That he always will be. The, the phrase, yesterday, today, and forever... It is a is a common expression, and it was a common expression in the Old Testament. It embraced all aspects of time. But folks, there's a fascinating, and I won't take you back and look at it, but if you looked at Psalm 90, Psalm 103, Psalm 106, you see the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. The Lord God of Israel. Folks, I want you to understand something. Israel was not saved, but by faith in the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he was 
the Savior then. He's the Savior now. And he always will be the Savior. And again, I want you to just stop and think about the implications of that with me. Because it indicates that Jesus Christ has always and for all time been the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in the fullness of time he became a man. Born of a woman. Born under the law. But that happened because it was God's plan since before the foundation of the world. That his son would be crucified. Christ got in trouble for this. Look at John 8. Look at John 8. Jesus got in big trouble for this. Um, and, and, and I have... I have a lot of cross references. I'm going to pull a Jim here. I, I, I loved it when Jim said, I got too many cross references. I'm going to put it on a PowerPoint. And I had trouble following. And, and I might never do this again in my life. Uh, but I, I want you to see some of these cross references. All right. Christ got in trouble for this. In John chapter 8, verse 54, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him. And I keep his word. Verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Now stop and think about that. Here Jesus is saying to the Jews, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And you could just see the blood curdle and you could see the hair stand up on their, their necks. Well, you're the carpenter's son. How can you say that Abraham rejoiced to see your day? and was glad. Verse 57. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say unto you, Before Abraham was, What? I am. Not, not before Abraham was, I was. Before Abraham was, I am. I am Simply because I am. I am in and of myself. What was Jesus saying? Well, I'll tell you what he was saying because the, the scribes and the Pharisees got it right. They understood it. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them. And so passed. Why did they pick up stones to throw at him? Because he was guilty of blasphemy in their mind. Because he just claimed to be the great I am. Can I jump to the chase? Whatever that phrase means. Believers, the great I am is your Savior. The great I am is your Savior. The one that took Moses and Israel through the Red Sea is my Savior. The one that fed Israel with, with water and manna and quail is my Savior. Think of that when you think of Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today. And think about that when you think of the, the, the blessed, assured faith and hope of Hebrews that says persevere if they saw you in sunder persevere if you're dead or raised from the dead persevere why because the great I am is my Savior the writer of Hebrews pointed to this early look at Hebrews chapter 1 um, Hebrews chapter 1 but to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And by the way, he's quoting Psalm 45. The writer of Hebrews is quoting Psalm 45. 
where it says, but to the Son, he says, to the Son, God the Father says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not fail. Folks, this was the message of Hebrews from the very beginning. He wanted the Jews to know that this Jesus of Nazareth that, that the, the apostles are, are preaching in his name the forgiveness of sin is not some new fangled message it's not some some strange this is what the scripture has said from the beginning and that savior is God that savior you can, can't you see it? Can't you see the Jews in the first century that didn't quite get it? And here's this message about this Nazareth, a Nazarene. He's from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? And he was a carpenter's son. We know who his dad was. He fixed my ox cart one time. That's extra biblical. But, but can you see them saying, wait, wait a minute. I, I'm supposed to trust him? My God took my fathers through the Red Sea. My God fed all of Israel manna and water from the rock. And, and the writer of Hebrews is saying, do you understand that that God is this God and this Savior? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Oh, can you imagine a Jew getting it? Can you imagine him getting it? And saying, oh, Lord Jesus. But you know, I, I think there's a kind of a parallel there because in, in Christendom today, in our world today, there's those of us that somehow separate. And, and by the way, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three in one, absolutely. Nothing I say today denies that. So don't anybody go out here and say, Jeff doesn't believe in the Trinity anymore. Nope. They are three and one. But what I think we often miss is that Jesus Christ is Jehovah, is the great I Am. And He's the one that died and rose again and promises to take you through. We need to get that. Amen? But we need to get that. And if you're sitting there saying, Jeff, I got that. I got that years ago. I'm good. Praise the Lord. Rejoice with the rest of us and pray that, that we can grow in this. Thus, the Lord Jesus of the New Testament is no less than Jehovah of the Old Testament. The Jews may have struggled with that. Many today, I think, struggle with that because we think, well, there's the God in the Old Testament. You know, and he's kind of the angry one. And then there's Jesus. And, and, and as a result, we make Jesus something far less than he is. And you know the writer of Hebrews was concerned about that too. Because he says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And my friend, someday Jesus is coming back with wrath. And do you know what his wrath is going to be poured out on? And, and this is a whole other study. It is going to be poured out on those who trampled underfoot 
the blood of the covenant. And the Lord Jesus Christ encountered it a common thing and failed to see that the one they needed to believe and trust in and follow is the Lord God, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's serious stuff. And by the way, folks, that's why there's not many ways to heaven. We hear that too today. Ah, there's all kinds. No. And the next point, we'll talk about that some more. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. My friends, your friends that are trusting another way are on their way to hell. Do we believe that? This, this, is, this is so serious, so important. So, again, at first, verse 8 might seem disconnected from verse 7, but, but I would submit to you that verse 8 is based on verse 7. Basically, the, the same God, the same Deliverer, the same Jesus that delivered all those Old Testament saints that the writer of Hebrews has looked out, this cloud of witnesses, Abel and Enoch and Abraham and Moses and Jephthah and David and the same God that led David onto the battlefield. Wants to be our Lord, our God, our Savior and take us through this life. Oh, that we would get that. Amen? Oh, that we would remember that every morning when we get up. And every night when we go to bed. And as a result, and I know I've already, because I jumped ahead, but the new covenant teaching of the Messiah is not some new weird teaching. Jesus Christ is Jehovah. He's the great I am. He's the ancient of days. He's God's plan of the ages. No wonder Jesus confronted Nicodemus in John 3 when he said to Nicodemus, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't know this stuff? Why? Because it's there. And it's been there throughout Scripture and history. But if we're not careful, we separate it. And we miss who Jesus really is. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 10, and I forget I have a PowerPoint here. Oh, hey, there it is. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. <clears throat> the Old Testament saints drank from the same spiritual rock as the New Testament saints. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all ate, uh, all, excuse me, all, and all drank the same spiritual drink. Who's he talking about there? Israel, right? In the desert, right? Keep going, verse whatever. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So Paul's preaching to the church at Corinth, and he said, listen, you and I know that our fathers were all baptized into Moses. They all, they all experienced Moses' leadership and, and the sea, the Red Sea crossing, and all that stuff. And they ate the same spiritual food, manna, bread from heaven. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And they all drank the same spiritual drink. For they all drank of that rock which followed them. Who was following Israel through the wilderness? 
giving them bread and giving them water. The eternal Son of God. And that rock was Christ. But don't miss that last statement. But with many of them, what? God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the water. Why was God not well pleased with many in Israel back then? Because God had shown himself real. God had made himself fully known to be able to take care of them, right? Uh, how many of us read those stories and go, those, those dummy Israelites, why don't they get it? God had made himself fully known, demonstrated his love, demonstrated his ability, his power, and yet they still didn't trust him to be able to take care of them. And so many of their bodies dropped in the wilderness. Why? Because they didn't trust Jesus, God. Now, I understand they didn't know all the detail like we do looking back. But they, even though God had faithfully shown himself willing and able and ready and promised, they doubted and they wouldn't trust and they died. And Paul's saying this to New Testament churches. Why? Because there's no difference. Many people today in churches just like ours have seen a God who in Christ has made himself known, has promised to redeem and save, has shown himself more than able and capable. And yet still, just like Israel in the wilderness, they say what? Can't trust you. Can't trust you to take care of this. And so they never trust Jesus. They keep doing their own works to try to get there. And their bodies will drop one by one under the wrath of God. Why? Because they trample underfoot the blood of the everlasting covenant and count it a common thing. It's no different. That's how serious it is. And the writer of Hebrews knows that we need to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ that he's talking about, who is our great high priest, is not some new thing. It's not some strange doctrine. It is the same gospel that's been preached from the beginning to the end. And, and, and my friend, the writer of Hebrews talks about that. I don't know if I have that. No, I don't. Let me see. Yeah, I'm not going to take the time to do it, but let me just point you back to Hebrews 3 and 4. Because in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, the writer of Hebrews says, you know, there's a promise to enter God's rest. But those that that message was first preached to didn't enter into it. Do you know why? Because they didn't believe. And he says, those who work will never enter the rest. And God told them, take a Sabbath rest. Stop working. They kept working. And God was angry. Why? And God dealt with that severely. Why? Because God had finished the work. And you and I have no business thinking that we can add to His work. And yet in Hebrews chapter 4, the writer of Hebrews says, those who believe and cease from their works enter the rest that God promised. My friends, I would submit to you that the Sabbath rest that God wants for you and I as New Testament believers is to stop trying to work your way to heaven because Christ has finished the work. From the foundations of the world. He was slain. 
and, and again, we see that, the, the message of Hebrews 3 and 4. And we, and we saw that. So, all that to say this, spiritual stability comes to the New Testament believer as we understand that the Savior we trusted in is the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal, self-existing God. He is not an afterthought. He is not plan B. How do we know that? Well, Scripture teaches us. Uh, that's too small for you to see, right? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise his, your head and you shall bruise his heel. The, the Messiah, the Deliverer, was prophesied in Genesis 3.15. Uh, we see that he's the fulfillment of the promised seed to Abraham in Galatians chapter 3.16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds plural, as of many, but as of one. And to your seed who is Christ. Christ is the promised seed of the Abrahamic covenant that was before the Mosaic law. And it's the promise of the coming Redeemer. And it was Jesus Christ. He is the Lamb, Revelation 13, 8, who was slain from before the foundations of the world. Now think about that. In God's economy, in God's timetable, in God's plan, Jesus Christ was slain before the foundations of the world. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, is the one and only Messiah. 1 Peter chapter 1, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. I, I, again, understand that our Savior, Jesus Christ, was, is, always, is the one and only Savior of the world. It's not a new plan, not a, not a new, new program. God's plan has always been to reveal Him through the Scripture. This is kind of an aside, but I, I think this is so important. Um, Titus chapter 1 says this. Um, in Titus chapter 1 we read, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised before time began but has in due time manifest his word through preaching which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now, now, now Paul is telling Titus that, that God who foreordained us commanded that, that this be made manifest through preaching. Now I would submit to you that it has nothing to do with a pulpit, a tie, or a coat. That has to do with the proclamation of the gospel. But I would submit to you that we need to understand that that needs to be a proclamation of the gospel of the scripture. And why do you say that, Jeff? Well, here's why. And I'm sorry these are so small, you can't read them. But Romans chapter 16. Um, look at Romans chapter 16 and verse 25. There's two verses, uh, two passages I want you to see on this. Remember how Paul said, how shall they believe in whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher? Do we believe that? 
that unsaved people will not come to faith without somebody coming and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ as contained in the scripture. Again, Paul said at the end of Romans, now, now watch this. Watch what scripture says. Romans 16, 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. Uh, according to the revelation of this mystery, this, this mysterious work of God that has been revealed which has kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the, what's the text say? By the prophetic scriptures, graphe, written revelation. Not my idea, not your idea, not my impression, not your impression. Not my experience, not your experience. But God has ordained that through the prophetic scripture. Made manifest and by the prophetic scripture has made known to all nations. According to the commandment of the everlasting God. Who commanded this? The everlasting God commanded this. For obedience to the faith. What do we need for obedience to the faith? We need to hear the scripture. We need to proclaim the scripture. Right? To God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. My friend. Our word world needs to hear about the Jesus that this book clearly describes and declares. And, and I wish we had time to get into the next point because the next point is don't be moved away to various and strange doctrines. And boy, are they prevalent in our world. Why? Because people are proclaiming a different Jesus and a different spirit and a different gospel than this book talks about. And yet everlasting God has commanded that through the proclamation of the prophetic scriptures, Jesus is to be preached. We need to preach the word. Our friends need to hear the word. Not my opinion, not your opinion, not, not my impression. Not, they need the. You know what's amazing? Years ago, turn, look at Luke 24, if you would. Luke 24. I'll never forget sitting in my office with a young man by the name of Justin, who was really struggling, still struggling today. But I, I, I remember us talking, and I remember just matter-of-factly turning to John 24 and it was about something different. I don't even remember what it was about. But let me just read it first. Luke 24, 25 to 27. Remember the two on the road to Emmaus? Remember that story? After the resurrection, Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus. Two of the disciples, not the apostles, but two of the disciples that had been with the apostles is walking toward Emmaus after all that. And they're talking. Jesus comes up and he hears them talking. He said, what are you talking about? Well, haven't you heard? Are you the only one in Jerusalem that hasn't heard about Jesus of Nazareth? We were hoping that he was the one who would save Israel. What did the Lord Jesus Christ do? Look, look at it. Um, Luke 24, 25. Then, then he said to them, and, and, and I got to get more of it. Hang on a second. Um, verse 19. 
And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company uh, who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels uh, who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then Jesus said to them. Now notice how Jesus ministered to these two. Then Jesus said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? What, what, what's he asking them there? What's he accusing them of? Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have said. Who were the prophets? All Old Testament. No New Testament scripture here. All Old Testament. And, and, and he says to them, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? Based on what, Jesus? The Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets. But keep going. Verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the... The what? The scriptures. The things concerning himself. That day in my office, I remember Justin saying, Wait, wait, wait! You mean Jesus? Who could have done anything? He could have turned something into something else and, and he could have made this appear or that disappear or that. And he did what? He did what, class? What did he do? He opened the scripture. Now, I, I don't think he had a scroll with him. I think it came from here. And from Moses, beginning in Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them from the scripture the things concerning himself. Folks, our world needs to hear about Jesus. The same yesterday, today, and forever. But they need to hear about him from here. And they need to hear about him from here, from you and me. Amen? And oh, what a glorious gospel that is. When we recognize and understand that the great I am the same God that took all those Old Testament saints through all that stuff wants to come and forgive you of all of your sin and give you His righteousness and put the Spirit of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in your heart to walk with you through everything next week has to offer and everything next year has to offer. And everything next year has to offer, so long as the Lord tarries. And, and folks, when I get that, okay, here we go. And we go with immense hope. And, and we go with assured hope. And when we get done on this fallen earth and fallen world with all of its junk, he takes me to glory to be with him. So even so, come Lord Jesus and come quickly. But until then, Lord, help me to walk with you every day. 
because you've got all the bread, all the water, all the light, all the protection, all the direction. There's nothing Satan can put in front of us that you can't part, that you can't take me through. And whether I see the dead raised or am sawn asunder, Lord, lead on. My friend, I, I have no, I, I'm not a prophet. I, I, <laughs> are you kidding? But I have no idea what's coming. But the changes I've seen in my lifetime make me think that, that, that we, are, we are headed for tough times. Unlike I think we've ever seen in our country, in our world. And, and I don't know about you. I, I would hope and I would pray. But I will tell you that what I want is that kind of faith and that kind of a Savior that would cause me to say, Lord, show me where and I'll go. Tell me what and I'll do. And, and I'll do it with hope. I'll do it with joy. I'll do it with peace. And when I struggle, Lord, pick me back up. Use the church to help me pick back up. And, and let's go. He who sustained Old Testament saints can sustain you and I. Um, folks, this is no new message. We see it in Hebrews. We see it in the Gospels. We see it in the Epistles. Jesus is the only way. Because Jesus is God. And with Jesus as our Lord and Savior, what will we face this week that we can't go through with victory? What's the answer? Nothing. Nothing. May the Lord help us. Amen? Father, I pray. I, I thank you, Lord, for the fact that Jesus Christ is the same. He was in eternity past. He is presently. He, he will be in eternity future. Always. The eternal Son of God. Whom you purposed. You foreordained that he would die for our sins, that he would rise again, that he would conquer sin and death and hell. Lord, that gospel message is no new thing. But, oh, Lord, as we will see in that next verse, there are many varied and strange doctrines that take people away from that true gospel. Father God, I pray that you would do a work in our hearts that would cause us to, to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. That, that would cause us to recognize the truth that as we look at those Old Testament saints and we look at what you did through them and, and what you did for them and how you watched out and protected and provided and directed Lord, you're the same. As you were then, you are now. Able to lead, to guide, to direct us. But Father, I would pray, knowing that many in Israel saw all that and yet refused to rest and trust in you. Lord, I pray for those today that have seen and heard of Jesus Christ who came, who lived, who died, who rose, who showed himself to be who he said he was. As one said, no one can do the things he does or say the things he does unless he be, be God, be of God. Lord, you have shown yourself faithful. Help us to proclaim that message. Help us to proclaim the Lord Jesus of the Bible. And Lord, I, I pray 
that, Lord, you would transform our hearts as a result. Lord, that our faith would, would be in God, that our faith would be in, in the unchanging God, that our faith would be in the great I Am who has promised not only to save us, but to take us through every trial of this life and accomplish your glory and your will. Lord, give us that faith, I pray. And Lord, help us to proclaim that good news, that gospel to the world around us. Father, you know our need. Impress it upon our hearts, I pray. And may we be changed more into your image as a result. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. If there is a need on your burden, prayer request, Talk to one of us before you leave. Let us talk to you, pray with you. We, I, we, we need to share our burdens. We need to share the things the Lord's doing and be a prayer in prayer and a help to one another. Is your hope in the Lord? 336 in your hymnal. Would you stand with me and let's sing victoriously 336 in your hymnal.